to sing praises unto our God. Is pleasant and praise is comely. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him, in those that hope in his mercy. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise thy God, O Zion. Let us pray together. Most gracious and holy God, as we come before you today in worship, we come to praise your great and wonderful name. Because in your great love for us, O God, you have redeemed us through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've called us to be your people, to proclaim your grace in this world. Lead us into your presence today, O God, and speak to our hearts. For we ask this through the name of our Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number two, Holy, 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 number two. Welcome to our service as we gather together to together as I said last week it's so nice to see everyone's smiling face here today um, joining us in worship um, and um, if you are online with us the service is brought, being broadcast online uh, welcome to you as well and um, God bless us as we worship him together Just a, a couple of announcements. Um, we still have the QR codes at the back that will take you to the order of worship. Um, in addition, if you would like to have your own hymn book, if you have a, your own hymn book at home, bring it back and forth with you and you can use it in the service. If uh, you would like to have your own hymn book for a donation, we can make that possible for you and then you just bring it back and forth with you. 
Bible study will be this Wednesday at 7 o'clock on Zoom, and I promise that I won't push the wrong button this week. Um, had a little, little issue last week, but um, we learn from it. In all of this, we are in a learning process, so if something doesn't quite work the way it's supposed to, um, we have the best of intentions and we have learned from the mistakes that we have made. Um, be patient with us. At this time, we will call upon Sarah and Yanis to minister to us in music. Thank you to Sarah and Yanis for your ministry to us this morning. As we approach God in prayer this morning, please be in prayer for our community and really our world as um, this virus continues to affect us. Um, and uh, pray that during this time we will be able to continue to give a witness to the gospel. Let us approach God in prayer. Most holy and gracious God, as we come before you today, we come so deeply aware of your presence and your grace that is at work in our world. You are, in fact, O oh God, our refuge and our strength. And as your word says, you are a very present help in our times of trouble. That your mercy and your grace is poured out upon us, O oh God. And you use the circumstances that we find ourselves in to accomplish your purposes in grace in our lives. And so we come and we yield ourselves to you in worship. We bring before you the lives that we live, O oh God, and we ask, Father, that you would show us your grace in a very real and powerful way as we face this time of crisis in our lives and in our world. We are trusting you, O oh God, to use these circumstances to cause us to grow in your grace, to experience your loving kindness, and to be able to be deepened in our faith in every way in our lives. 
Father, we bring our community before you at this time, and we ask that there would be healing among us, healing in relationships, healing in health, healing in our walk with you, healing in every way, O oh God. We ask the same, Father, for this world in which we live, as everyone is being affected by this trial. And Father, your word tells us that you chasten us, that we might draw near to you, that we might put our hope in you and in you alone. And so, Father, we come and we yield our lives to you. Work powerfully within us, O oh God. Father, we bring before you the, those that are shut in, and we ask, Father, for your love and your grace and your healing and protecting presence to be with them in this coming week. We bring those who are ill or in hospital before you, Father, and we ask, Father, that you would bring healing and strength to each one. We continue to bring before you those with special needs, whether they have requested prayer for salvation or for family needs or for grief or for guidance. You know the needs of each of these people, O oh God. You know the requests that they have made, and we bring them before you and ask that you would work powerfully in their lives. Father, we continue to bring before you the ministry of our church. As we meet together in this sanctuary, and as we share the service online in a live format, and as we meet together during the week online to study your word, we ask, Father, that you would make these ministries fruitful, that we would be able to share the gospel of the Lord Jesus in clear and powerful ways, and that this would lead others to faith in Christ. Father, we put this into your hands. We ask, Father, as well, that you would be with our partners in mission, the Godwin, the Copeland, the Albanet, and the Kwok families, as they serve you upon the mission field, O God. Keep them safe, but Father, also make their ministries fruitful, for they too share the love of Christ in the places that you have led them. Be with us today, O God. Show us your grace and your love in very powerful ways. For we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying...
singing hymn number 56, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name, number 56. Scripture reading this morning is found in the book of Micah, the seventh chapter, reading from verse 14 down to verse 20. Micah chapter 7, verses 14 to 20. Shepherd your people with your staff. The flock of your inheritance, which lives by itself in a forest, in fertile pasture lands, let them feed in Bashan and in Gilead, as in days long ago. As in the days when you came out of Egypt, I will show them my wonders. Nations will see and be ashamed, deprived of all their power. They will put their hands over their mouths, and their ears will become deaf. They will lick dust like a snake, like creatures that crawl on the ground. They will come trembling out of their dens. They will turn in fear to the Lord our God, and will be afraid of you. Who is a God like you, who pardons sin and forgives transgression? of the remnant of his inheritance. You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show love to Abraham 
as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Amen. May God add his blessing to this reading of his word. Let us pray together. Most gracious God, as we come before you today, we come to worship. We come to meditate for a few moments, O Lord, upon your word. And as we do so, Father, we know that you will send your spirit among us to instruct us that we might understand and apply your word to our lives. For, Father, we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. A number of years ago, there was a special program that was put together by the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association that was entitled, Here's Life Canada. And I'll never forget the first few lines of the advertisement for that special program. It was an online program. And the first lines of the advertisement were Billy Graham asking the question, where is the hope? Where is the hope in the situations that we were facing at that time? And we might ask the same question today. Where is the hope? Where do we find hope in the middle of a crisis? Where do we find hope as we are wrestling with our own nature? Where do we find hope as we fear what will come next? Where do we find hope? And that message of hope is really what's at the heart of the prophecy of Micah. Micah is writing and, and proclaiming his message in a time where it seems as if his society is falling apart. Judgment seems to be coming upon them. God is saying to them that various things will happen. They will be sent into exile. They will be warned and punished by all kinds of misfortunes. And the people are, some of them, in denial that this would ever happen. But others are saying that if this happens, does it prove to us that, that God is either non-existent or that, that God is uncaring regarding us, not faithful to his promises? And so the people of Micah's day are asking the question, where is our hope in this time of need as we are facing an uncertain future? And Micah delivers several prophecies in the little seven chapters of his book. And he concludes those prophecies with a lament. A prayer that he brings before God and in which he confesses the misery and the difficulty that God's people are facing. But in the middle of it, Micah gives his own testimony. And here's what he says in verse 7. As for me, I watch in hope. That word watch means I am eagerly looking in hope for the Lord. I wait eagerly for, for God my Savior. My God will hear me. My God will hear this prayer of confession. My God will hear my cry for help. Because that's where the hope is found. And as Micah goes on and concludes that prayer in the few verses that we read this morning, he 
comes and he asks a question that if we're looking for hope in our lives, a question that we must all answer. Verse 18, Micah asks this question. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl our iniquities into the depths of the sea. You will be faithful to Jacob and show your love to Abraham as you pledged on oath to our ancestors in days long ago. Who is a God like you? Full of grace and mercy, pardoning and forgiving sin and transgression, restoring people who come to you in faith, Who is a God like you? Because that is where we find our hope. Our hope is centered in the reality of the character and the holiness and the faithfulness of God. And the better we know him, the closer we draw to him, the more we become aware that our hope is only in him. Our hope is only in what he has promised to do in our lives. That is the gospel. That is the message of grace that the scriptures constantly proclaim to us. Way back in the book of Exodus, Moses had an encounter with God. And in Exodus 33 and 34, we see the, the account of that encounter. Moses in prayer comes before God, and God has been communicating with him of his nature and of his presence among, among his people. And finally, Moses has had enough of this communication. And so in chapter 33, verse 17, we read this. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked, because I am pleased with you, and I know, and I know you by name. Then Moses said, Now show me your glory. The word glory there means, show me your true weight. I want to see you as you are. Show that to me. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, Jehovah, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Interesting comment from God. Such is his holiness that no one can see it and live. Because to see the glory of God in its full measure would be to discover the depth of our ungodliness, of our sin. No one can see my face and live. But in the next chapter, God calls Moses up into his presence. And God says, as my glory is departing, you will see it departing, but you will not see it in its fullness. And in verse 6 of chapter 34, we read this. And he passed in front of Moses, proclaiming, 
Jehovah, Jehovah, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sins of the parents to the third and the fourth generation. Do you hear what, what God's word is saying there? Jehovah, Jehovah, the compassionate and gracious God who is slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness, forgiving wickedness but punishing sin. He will not leave sin unpunished. And so we look at that, and I'm sure Moses was scratching his head as he's hearing this revelation from God. How can this be? How can God be forgiving and, and at the same time punish all sinners? How can God be those two things at the same time? And so Moses is wrestling with that. Just as each of us at times in our lives wrestle with the very same thing. To encounter God is to encounter his holiness. And that always leads to us seeing ourselves as we really are. So how can God forgive our sin and at the same time hold us accountable for it? How can he punish sin and forgive it? Charles Haddon Spurgeon, before he was converted, had been a regular church attender and he was coming through a time of conviction of sin leading to his conversion. And he wrote in his journal later as he was wrestling with what he had experienced in coming to faith in Christ. He wrote in his journal that he could not see a way for him to be made right with God. Because he said, if God forgives my sin, then God will cease to be God. How can God forgive me if God is absolutely holy? And what Spurgeon came to understand was what the scriptures tell us in the book of Romans, the fifth chapter, as Paul is explaining the essence of the gospel to the Romans. And in the fifth chapter, actually, the sixth verse, Paul writes this, you see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Did you hear what Paul says? While we were still powerless, while we were still without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. So we ask a question. Who did Christ die for? How do you receive the grace of God in the gospel? And Paul says, you receive it if you are ungodly. So what Paul is saying is, I'm making a distinction. I'm making a distinction between those who receive the gospel and those who do not. The gospel is received by ungodly people. Everyone who thinks that they're right with God doesn't receive it. 
but the ungodly receive it. So the starting point, and as Spurgeon was wrestling with this, this is the starting point for him. If he recognized the depth of his sin and came to Christ not as a righteous man, but as an ungodly man, and cast himself upon the mercy of God, he would be forgiven. Because you see, God had done something incredibly powerful, but almost with, without our ability to comprehend. God had sent his only begotten son into this world to become human flesh, to become like us to take upon himself, upon his perfect being, his sinless being, to take upon himself the sin of the ungodly. My sin and your sin. And to bear the punishment for it on the cross. And in doing that, to reconcile us to God. Therefore, God can hold us to account for our sin because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. You can almost imagine it if there was a big enough sign and as Jesus is being crucified, the charge against him was, was posted in all of its detail. That if you look closely, you would find a line with your name on it. And all your sin recorded. And Christ died for it. In our place. That's why Paul says to the Galatians, I have been crucified with Christ. It is now no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. As Spurgeon reflected upon his conversion, and upon what God had done, he found himself saying God's thoughts, God's approach, God's dealing with us is not the way we would have done it. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. They are above our thoughts. The prophet Isaiah in the 55th chapter of his prophecy, starting in verse 7, says this. Actually, we'll start back in verse 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them, them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Where is the hope? The scriptures confront us with this hope that, that God has provided. And what God says to us is our hope is not in our willpower to overcome the deficiencies in our lives. Our hope is not found in the fact that we wake up one morning and we say, I'm going to do better. I'm going to make something of my life. 
Our hope is not in our plan. I'm reading a book right now, um, somewhat appropriate, um, Reinventing Retirement. Um, as if it's possible to do that. Um, but the author says that you've got to have a plan. You've, you've, you've got to detail that plan out so that you know what you're doing, so that you will be a successful retiree and not a failed one. Well, great advice. I'm still reading the book. Um, I'm at the end of chapter two. So um, hopefully there's lots of good advice there. But the assumption is that if you only put enough thought into it and have enough willpower and enough goodness in your life you can overcome everything and so we come before God and we say look at the success I've made of my life as the Pharisee did when he came into the temple to pray we say thank you Lord that you've made me as I am thank you that I tithe and I don't just tithe a little bit, I tithe all the herbs in my garden as well. Thank you that you didn't make me like that tax collector who's at the back who doesn't even dare lift his eyes to God. It's said that for the Pharisees, one of their frequent prayers was to thank God that he hadn't made them a sinner or a woman. Well, that was there then. That's not now. And it's not biblical. Because the only approach to God that brings forgiveness and life to us is to come as the ungodly. To come before God and say, I have made a mess of this. I don't know how to get out of these sins that I've allowed to rule in my life. I don't know how to overcome my temperament. Did you know that we all have temperaments? That we all have personalities that sometimes have flaws? And we try to overcome them. I'm going to be better tomorrow. But we come before God and we say, I can't change. But as for me, Micah says, I watch in hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. And when God hears him, Micah's cry is, Who is a God like you? Who is a God who pardons sin and forgives transgression? Not in general, but personally. Who is a God like this who reaches into your life and into mine and forgives us in the most costly way possible through the humiliating death of his son on the cross. Who is a God like that? Who delights in showing the New International Version uses the word mercy. The word that's used there is the word hesed. It means steadfast, compassionate love that forgives and cleanses and makes right even though it is not deserved. It's grace. He delights to show grace. And what does he do with our sin? He hurls it, the scripture says, into the depths of the sea. When I was growing up, my father was a 
baritone soloist in our church. He's now with the Lord singing the Lord's praise. But he had a song that he would sing from time to time for our congregation. And one of the lines of that song was, My sins have been cast in the depths of the sea, down deep in the sea. And he just kept going deeper and deeper and deeper. Um, I couldn't follow him that deep. Um, but it made an impression upon this young life that when God deals with our sins, as Micah says, they are cast into the depths of the sea. Perhaps you have in your mind the, the picture at the or the scene at the end of the movie Titanic, where the as, it, as someone said, the old lady throws the necklace into the sea. Never to be found again. If you cast something into the sea, it's gone. And that's the imagery that Micah is using. God takes our sin and casts it into the depths of the sea. And we come before him as sinners, as the ungodly, who have been reconciled to God. And when we see him face to face, when we see him as he is, and we are so deeply aware that we are a sinner standing before a holy God, what does God say to us? What sin? What sin? Because all I see in you is the cross of Christ. Because you came to him and your sin was taken and cast into the depths of the sea. And now what I see is the love of Christ. We need to keep asking ourselves Micah's question. Who is a God like Jehovah? Who is a God like our Lord Jesus Christ who pardons our sin and forgives our transgressions and who delights to show us mercy? That's where our hope is. And that's where our hope will always be anchored. No matter what we face in this life, even at the point of death, what do we discover? Our hope is in the Lord. It is in the one who died for us. It is in the grace of God poured out upon us. And the question for us is, do we believe that simple fact? Let us pray together. Who is a God like you, O God? With mercy and grace so rich and free. With the desire, the delight to forgive, to be gracious to reconcile us to yourself at great cost. Who is a God who would do that in our lives? Father, we are so thankful that we can come to you today and know that through the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come boldly to your throne of grace and receive forgiveness. Lead us today, Father, and pour out your grace upon us. For we ask this in the name of our Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. Please join me in singing hymn number 240, He Died for Me, 240.
us pray together. Go with us today, O God. Pour out your grace and your love upon us that we might serve you and glorify you living in the gospel of Christ each and every day. Amen.